Welcome everyone. I'm Dr. Janelle Gray, the chair of the Department of Thoracic Oncology here at Moffitt Cancer Center. And thank you so much for joining us this evening for an information-packed webinar. I am confident that you'll find value in what my colleagues and I have to share today. Okay, to begin with, I have to do some housekeeping items. So the content is not to be intended to be used for medical advice and viewers should consult with their physician should they have any questions at all. The viewers may not rely on the information contained in this webinar for immediate or urgent medical needs. Additionally, if you are having a medical emergency, please do call your physician, go to the nearest emergency room or call 911 immediately. Uh, Never disregard professional medical advice or seeking uh, care when you need it. We do not want anything to be delayed for you because this information um, or because of anything you hear in this webinar. Again, we're so pleased to have you tonight. We'll share some of these exciting breakthroughs throughout the evening, starting with our first speaker. Before I introduce him, I do want to remind everybody that when we are finished hearing from our speakers, you will have the opportunity to have your questions answered by these experts. And we invite you to type your questions into the Q&A box located right there at the bottom of your screen. Okay, and now on to our first presentation. Let me first introduce Dr. Larry Robinson. I'm so in, uh, pleased to introduce him. He is a senior member in the Moffitt Cancer Center's Department of Thoracic Oncology, and he's going to be speaking to you more about our research on early detection, the resources that we need in order to enable this, and the biomarker, along with their importance of doing biomarker testing in this setting to promote early detection. And with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Larry Robinson. Thank you, Janelle. Um, I'm one of the five thoracic surgeons at Moffitt. I've been here for 28 years, and my interest primarily is in early stage lung cancer, and I'll talk to you a little bit about some of our uh, newest interests. I'm just going to give you and kind of beat you over the head with the whole statistics thing about lung cancer because it's a real problem worldwide. There's almost a quarter of a million people in the United States who get lung cancer every year. There's about 2 million worldwide. Unfortunately, about 130,000 people die from this disease every year. That's one person every four minutes. And just to give you some perspective, that's as if everyone in Gainesville, Florida, excluding the, sur the C students, died every year. So there's an enormous problem, and it's a, it's a great health problem. The number of people who die from lung cancer every year equal the next three cancers combined. In fact, one out of every 16 people in the United States, if you ignore the smoking status, will get lung cancer. There's currently about 100 people on this, uh, this webinar right now, and that means about six or seven people in this webinar statistically will get lung cancer in their lifetime. And one of the things that's changed in lung cancer is that never smokers are starting to get lung cancer. As many as 25% of the women who smoke get lung, uh, uh, never smokers get lung cancer. I see at least one every week, a lady who's doesn't seem to have any risk factors, never smoker with lung cancer. It's about 10% of men who get lung cancer are never smokers. And one of the biggest problems about why there's so many people who die from lung cancer is that only about less than a quarter of people are diagnosed early when the survivals are highest, we have the highest chance of cure. One of the things that happens every year is there's about at least 1.6 million lung nodules found. Uh, most of them are incidental. Somebody comes into the emergency room, uh, has some chest pain, they get a CT angiogram to see if they have any evidence, they've thrown a clot to the lung, and there's an incidental finding of a lung nodule. The problem is at least two thirds of those nodules are not followed, and some of those are lung cancers that could have been cured if they were found early. And then the lung nodules out in the community, many times, most of the time, these nodules are not, uh, not followed appropriately. They don't, there's a lot of very specific lung nodule management guidelines, and they're not followed by almost two-thirds of the clinicians because they don't see them very often. And a lot of the, there's a lot of uh, knowledge that's missing in taking care of lung nodules. And then there's a lot of lung biopsies that are completely unnecessary. It's estimated that almost half of the lung nodules, CT-guided needle biopsies, all these biopsies are uh, unneeded. 
and at least 44%, this is in large studies, they have benign nodules. As you see over in the far right-hand side, the survival rates. If you find an early stage cancer that we'd like to find, you can have a very high five-year survival rate, which means five-year cure. Now, Moffitt does even a lot better than they do nationally. As you can see, 70% of the people who get early stage lung cancer uh, that are uh, seen in Moffitt are cured. It's about 61% nationally. Once you start advancing the stage, it becomes a more advanced stage. You see the survival rates go down in the, advanced, the very advanced stage of metastatic disease. It gets down quite low. Well, how do we find lung cancer early? The only way, next slide, the only way that's been shown to be of, of value and benefit is low-dose screening chest CT scans. It's the only proven way. We've known since 2013 that you can decrease the uh, mortality of probably at least 20% if you get people who are appropriate and who are at, at elevated risk to get an, a low-dose screening CT scans. The eligibility criteria now have come down to people who are at high risk for lung cancer and would benefit from a low-dose screening CT scan or people who are 50, 80 years or more of age, currently smoke or they quit within the last 15 years and have at least 20 pack year history of smoking. Now, 20 pack years, we're talking about like one pack a, a day for a year is one pack year. So we're talking about, for example, 20 pack years would be one pack a day for 20 years, et cetera. If people got screened who are eligible for that, we would do a great deal of, of good. The people in the United States, there's about 14 and a half million people, therefore, who meet these criteria. This is more people than live actually in the state of Pennsylvania. Unfortunately, only about five and a half percent of the people who are eligible get screening CT scans. If we could get everyone to get a screening CT scan who is eligible, we would find enough cancer to save about 60 to as much as 80,000 lives every year. That's more than twice the people that can be held in the uh, Washington Nationals uh, Park. You see a, a picture there. These are people who could be potentially saved from dying from lung cancer if we could find them early. Now, in Florida, it's even worse. 3% of the people who are eligible to get screened actually get screened. There's a million people in Florida who are eligible to get screened who are at high risk. And again, only 3% get screened. In fact, if we could get all those million people in Florida get screened, we'd save probably about six to 8,000 lives every year. If you look at the other kind of screening for other cancers, breast cancer screening that has a very high number of the women who are eligible to get breast cancer screening, at least 75%, 76%. Colon is about a two thirds. Prostate, as you see, it's cervical around the bottom. So there's a very high amount of screening compared to what we do with breast cancer. And there's many reasons for that. There's a lot of reasons about uh, people not knowing that they need to get screened, they're not eligible. A lot of the uh, healthcare providers aren't sure of the eligibility criteria. They're concerned about the cost. And I mentioned, if you have eligible for a uh, screening CT scan, it's paid for completely by Medicare, Medicaid, and all the insurance companies because it's very cost effective. So it's it's free, basically. And there's some problems also with access out in the rural community. In fact, Moffitt is in the process of of starting now, we hope to have a mobile CT scan screening bus that will be able to go out in the community and offer screening CT scans to eligible people. We hope to have that up and running, hopefully within the first part of this coming year. Another problem that we have with chest or with uh, lung cancer is stereotypes. Can I have the next slide, please? There's a myth about lung cancer. As you see this picture on the left, you probably remember seeing this for to, uh, for tobacco cessation ads that used to show up on the DVDs that you got a DVD to show a movie. This is Hollywood's stereotypical image of a lung cancer patient. And this is what people actually think. They think that this is a cancer only occurs in a set population, people with bad chronic lung disease, heavy smokers, and that sort of thing. And there's also a stigma associated with smoking. And in fact, lung cancer was for a long time considered the invisible cancer. In fact, the ribbon that first came out for lung cancer was clear had it clear because it was invisible, but people weren't looking at it. They were considering, well, if you didn't smoke, you wouldn't lung cancer. Well, that's not the case. By the way, the, uh, the man in this picture is an actor. He doesn't have lung cancer at all. This is just Hollywood. Next slide. This is the kind of people who actually develop lung cancer. The lady on the left was a former New York model, 49 years old. 
She told me she smoked a little bit when she was a model because that uh, decreased her appetite. In fact, a lot of the models did, decreased her appetite. She smoked for four or five years. And she was actually, this lady was on the cover of Vogue in the past. When she was 49 years old, she developed a pancose tumor, which is a very large, uh, painful tumor in the top part of the chest. Fortunately, she responded to treatment, surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation therapy, and is nine years out free of disease. You can see her with her children and her husband. The lady on the right, uh, is a uh, never smoker. She happened to get a chest CT scan in 2019 when she had some shortness of breath and that went away and they saw a little tiny nodule. Unfortunately, it was three years before that nodule was followed up. Unfortunately, but fortunately for her, it hadn't spread and it was slightly larger. We took that out about, uh, about three months ago. It was an early stage one lung cancer. She's probably cured. She sent me this picture. She was proud of herself. Three weeks after she had a lung resection, she was out hiking in the Colorado mountains. Most of our patients are quite that good, but I couldn't resist putting the picture of her. She was quite, quite a lady. She a, owns a blueberry farm in Pasco County. Brought in blueberries every time we saw her. Great blueberries. Next slide, please. So what we've elected to do is try to have a more formalized approach so we can offer uh, good follow-up and evaluation of lung nodules. Now we see lung nodules now, but not in as much of a formal um, a clinic. So we're organizing what we call a lung nodule clinic, which is dedicated to evaluate and manage patients who have pulmonary nodules, which have no diagnosis, hopefully finding a number of people with early stage, potentially curable disease. We'll see patients hopefully within a week of their, uh, they ask to be seen. We plan to have a treatment plan, evaluation, order any appropriate work that needs to be done. We have a software program. We're just actually gonna be uh, talking with the folks tomorrow and probably open that software program because a big problem with lung nodules is follow up and keeping track of people so they don't fall through the cracks. I just saw a lady yesterday, small lung nodule four years ago, fell through the cracks, nothing happened. She finally got another chest CT scan four years later. I saw her yesterday. Now she has lymph nodes all enlarged in the center of the chest. So she's gone from an early stage curable cancer to a, a, an advanced stage cancer, and she has a much lower cure. She fell through the cracks. Software programs help us not rely just on hand, uh, handwritten notes. That's one of the problems about a lot of providers worry about lung nodules, that they're worried they don't have a good way of managing and tracking people. And we plan to do is reassure the, any referring providers that the lung nodule clinic will take full responsibility for the evaluation and follow up of their nodules so they don't need to worry about those patients. Yet, the referring provider can have those patients come back to follow up them for their other healthcare needs, to follow their, their diabetes, their, their hypertension, that sort of thing. And then a nodule clinic also offers an excellent research opportunities. And I'm just gonna tell you about one study that we're getting ready to start right now, which we're very excited about. Next slide. And this has to do with biomarkers. First of all, biomarkers, what is a biomarker? It's any substance, which is usually either tissue or blood, we use to measure and predict outcome of disease. Now, most all of the men know what a PSA is. PSA is a nice blood test for prostate cancer. Very few prostate cancers will be found that are not PSA positive. So most men every year, they will get a PSA level. If it's normal, you're probably in good shape. If it's elevated, it could be from prostatitis and everything else, but it may, it uh, merits being followed up. We'd like to find reliable biomarkers for patients for early stage disease. Now we have some good biomarkers for late stage disease that determine treatment. The biomarkers for early stage disease really haven't been really found very well. So we're in the process of doing a study where we take, we're gonna look at biomarkers, actually several blood studies to try to look at patients observationally wise who come in with a lung nodule and try to determine based on the biomarker whether it's cancer or benign. And now we will treat the patient normally and this will be observationally and we'll look back and see how accurate they are. I'm hopeful that probably five years from now, we won't be relying on finding screening CT scans to find lung cancer. We'll be able to get blood biomarkers done just in your physician's office. If it's elevated, then you go get the CT scan. We're also looking for patients uh, to try to figure out how we can prevent recurrence of disease or find recurrence before it's in a major problem. Even if I operate on somebody who has a two centimeter, in other words, about a, a seven, eight cent, uh, inch diameter cancer, all lymph nodes are negative. You'd say, well, aren't they cured? Well, they probably have about an 80% cure rate because about 20% of those will have microscopic disease elsewhere we can't find. 
So we'd like to figure out, is there something we can do? If you take all of those patients and just give them chemotherapy afterwards, you can't really change their survival rates and you can't change the cure rates. But if you could select the proper people who are at high risk for recurrence, it's been shown pretty well that you can give chemotherapy afterwards and decrease their recurrence rates almost zero. Also, we're looking for ways for follow-up patients for second primaries, and we're also going to use biomarkers. So this study, which is actually supported by patient donations, we have some grants pending, but we're not waiting for grants. Grants take forever some days just to get them through. Um, and fortunately, we have some grateful patients who've donated the money so we can start this study, which is actually starting within two weeks. Next slide, please. So we've developed a whole program for early stage lung cancer, which we call the Lung Cancer Early Detection Center or the LEAD Center. And we'll actually have three clinics that will be able to manage early stage lung cancer. We'll have the screening clinic where we can manage patients who have screening CT scans and have positive screens, and they can be referred to the lung nodule clinic, which I'm going to staff, and we'll have patients, we'll be following up patients and determining what to do with them. And then we also have the long-term surveillance program. And that's extremely important because if you have a cancer that you're cured from, you still have about a one to one and a half percent chance per year of having a second primary cancer and need to have screening CT scans followed up essentially indefinitely. And we have a surveillance program for people who are cured and they can come back and be followed along to make sure they don't fall in the cracks because if you get a second primary cancer, you have a good chance if you catch it early of being cured. So this lead program, we're going to officially um, go with this starting sometime in the next two weeks. And this, we hope to really help provide patients an opportunity for early cure. Thank you very much. Wonderful, Larry. That was absolutely a fantastic presentation. Um, you know, I think it really speaks to the importance of meeting with your primary care physician, seeing if you are uh, or have high risk features, you know, or giving us a call at Moppin will help determine whether or not you qualify for the lung cancer screening, which is really a low dose CT scan, and how we can move things forward to make sure that we identify who are really those high risk patients beyond what those clinical um, measures that you spoke about. All right, and with that, we'll move to Dr. Matt Shabath. Dr. Shabath is a cancer epidemiologist and an associate member of Moffitt's Department of Thoracic Oncology. And he'll be speaking to you more about the future of treatment and using artificial intelligence for patient care. With that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Shabbat. Thank you, Dr. Gray. Let me see, do I have control yet? Yes, okay. Well, you know, Dr. Gray said the future of, of um, thoracic care, but I'll, push back and say the future is now. Um, artificial intelligent methods um, are available in real time. We've been applying, Moffitt has actually been a leader in this area, developing methods to improve the care of patients all the way from early detection to treatment response. But I, I do wanna um, preface that there are a lot of myths with artificial intelligence. Things like Artificial intelligence is gonna take away jobs. It's going to get smarter on its own, learn on its own, and it's gonna make medical decisions and diagnosis. And of course, you know, Dr. Robinson was talking about Hollywood, that AI will somehow take over the world. And we saw that in movies like Terminator and The Matrix. The reality is it comes down to a really simple, simple premise. And I'll walk you through this in a couple slides. It's all it's going to do is help medical providers like Dr. Gray, like Dr. Robinson, that lung nodule clinic, comprehend, interpret complex healthcare data in new ways. And in many ways, it's going to be much more rapid through because we're using a lot of methodology and a lot of technology that is in existence. And we don't need any extra testing necessarily. And if you didn't know this, all of if anybody that has a smartphone on themselves, pull it out, go look at your photos. We all are using AI uh, on, on our I, iOSs or our Google apps. All of the, those phones are able to classify. That classification is an AI process that is able to group our friends or in Google our pets and, and even places and, and things like um, you know musical instruments or whatever the case may be. So this has been around, but it's finally making way into research and eventually we will get it into standard of care. So how does it work? Well, one way is identifying patterns 
in data, not capable by traditional statistical methods. So when you look at this little uh, blurb on the left where you have all this, all this data, there's all this mess, um, AI can take that on its own and basically bin this into categories. And uh, th why this is important to lung cancer will come, will come uh, into fruition in, in a minute. What a lot of work that my team does is uh, can identify patterns in images that are not discernible to the human eye or brain. And so we've already, Dr. Robinson already introduced low dose CTs. What we've done um, is we are able to take those low dose, low dose CTs and use AI methodologies to actually diagnose lung cancer without tissue. We can actually, with very high accuracy, discriminate be between benign and malignant lesions. So the AI becomes, in a sense, the biomarker that Dr. Robinson introduced. And what's really, really important is that as, an, as AI is exposed to new data, in other words, when you start off with 500 patients, you're able to reach a level of classification of say benign and malignant let's say 90% accuracy. But if you introduce another 500 patients down the road, it's only gonna improve because it's learning more. It's not learning on its own because you're feeding it the data. We're feeding it these images, we're feeding it the data and it's gonna improve. And here's an example. Um, this is me on the, uh, on the right, the old version of me. And this is Google and it learned who I was through hundreds of pictures that I've uploaded to my phone. And so it automatically classifies it. And so a couple of years ago, I found this little picture of me. That's, uh, I think I was five at Christmas. I uploaded it and it had pattern recognition. Google said, is this you? Is this the same person? And you can see no gray hair, no beard, no wrinkles, but it recognized it. So that's just a, a simple proof of concept that as you introduce more data, it's going to improve its performance. In a nutshell, and I've already said this, AI can help solve classification problems very accurately. So what does this do with lung cancer? These two patients, these are actually two patients from the National Lung Screening Trial. The National Lung Screening Trial is why we have lung cancer screening. It was the trial that demonstrated the efficacy of low-dose CTs. This is their first scan. So eligible patients, the criteria that Dr. Robinson introduced, Patients come in and get their first scan, and I circled the nodule on both of these. They look relatively same size, largely the same shape. What do we do? So there's several broad approaches today. Wait and watch. The pro of that, no further testing. The con, anxiety. If you're told you have a nodule and you're told to come back, say, in a year, nine months, six months, there's a lot of anxiety. And there's a potential undiagnosed cancer going on there. More imaging, um, that's a low risk procedure. You don't need a biopsy, uh, a bronch or anything like that. You're also on the con side, you're, you're exposed to more radiation. And that additional imaging gives you more information, but it's still not definitive of a diagnosis. The diagnosis really comes down to having that tissue and pathology. You can biopsy, brilliant surgeons like Dr. Robinson do this all the time. This should yield a de definitive diagnosis, but not always. Sometimes you just don't get enough adequate number of cells. There's an, an associated with potential comorbidities because it is an invasive procedure. And the worst case scenario going straight to surgery, it gives you a definitive diagnosis, but it's very high risk and it's the potential for an unnecessary surgery. And this is, and then this is real life. This is one year later, that patient on the bottom has a cancer diagnosis, and I'm sorry, the words got cut out. The patient on the top, it turned out it was a ben actual benign lesion. The patient on the bottom, bottom actually had a cancer diagnosis, and it, they went a year without any intervention on that. So how can I, AI help this issue? So what we did is we use AI methods to analyze that first low dose CAT scan from about 1000 patients. With the goal is can we predict among those of those thousand patients at, at their first CAT scan, can we predict the future? Can we predict who is gonna diagnose with cancer in the future? So the answer is yes. Obviously I'm gonna say yes because I wouldn't be presenting this anyways. Um, we use the first CAT scan and we can predict with over 90% 90 90 accuracy who will be diagnosed with a 
cancer in the future. And our accuracy was higher than volume, which is um, often used clinically, and it's higher than standard of care risk models as well. And so this is now a potential tool to inform our lead clinic on how to manage patients. To, and it's not going to override their instinct and knowledge. It's, it's really there to give them more data, more information in real time. And so now they have this information and now they can use this. They'll get a, they would get a, a risk score and they can then determine with the patient, have that conversation of what do we wanna do next? And I, I know it's a busy slide and there's some links. So if, if you could take a screenshot if you want, but the applications of AI in healthcare are happening in rapid speed right now. It's across the board, you know, clearly here, we're talking about cancer, what I showed you what we're doing in cancer research related to medical diagnosis. But these are really just a snapshot of what's happening out in the research. And eventually this is gonna be delivered to our patients to really deliver more precise, more accurate and more rapid clinical decision. I think that's my last slide. So thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Shabbat. That was an amazing presentation and, and really being able to, um, uh, oops, okay. I am unable to turn my camera back on. Um, I don't know if one of the hosts can please uh, release that or they can turn my camera on for me, please. Okay. So if we can, um, you know, it's really about taking a complex set of information and really distilling it down and helping us to understand what the benefit is of having this AI software, having these AI tools and how they can help us move the field forward. And really, again, it's about helping to identify patients um, as much as we as much as we can early on as well as personalizing their therapy. All right, oh, perfect. Thanks so much for getting that corrected. I appreciate it. All right, and then at this time, I wanted to just take a moment if I could and introduce you to one of our partners here at Moffitt, uh, Jay Dichter. Jay is the Moffitt, uh, with the Moffitt Foundation and he partners with our thoracic oncology program to ensure that we re receive the research dollars that we need to get clinical research and some of the um, areas that you just heard about really launched off the ground and make advances ultimately in cancer treatments and improving outcomes for our patients. Um, if you would like to learn more about how you can help, uh, please contact Jay. And I'm gonna ask uh, Jay, would you mind if you, uh, saying a few words to those uh, online with us today? More than happy to. Hi, uh, hi uh, as, as Dr. Gray said, my name is Jay Dichter. And I am the foundation partner for the Thoracic Oncology Program here at Moffitt. And I just wanted to take a moment uh, to say thank you, not only to our incredible presenters and, of course, the exceptionally wonderful Dr. Gray, uh, but to all of those of you in attendance uh, this evening who've helped support the exemplary work being done here at Moffitt. Um, there's no doubt that the future of cancer is happening right here at Moffitt. And, of course, if this evening's presentation was any inclination, uh, that future is already here. So if you're interested in supporting cancer research, please contact me directly. Uh, together, we can continue to revolutionize cancer care and provide the best possible outcomes for our patients. Um, thanks again. And, and thank you, Dr. Gray, for the invitation to join you this evening. Absolutely. And thank you, Jay. And thank you for all that you and our uh, philanthropy does to, to make research even possible and move the needle. Um, I can tell just from the questions that we've had come in that we have patients joining us and, uh, you know, we cannot get things, we can't get dr new drugs approved, new agents available for you in the clinic and really move that needle honestly without um, the proper funding to do so. So appreciate everybody joining us today. Now I'm going to move, uh, I think, to a more interactive portion of our session and we'll move to the Q&A. Um, I do, again, remind everybody that you can write your question in the Q&A box at the bottom uh, of the screen. I'm going to um, go ahead and um, uh, our faculty, perfect, have uh, uh, opened up their cameras. I'm going to kick us off here with some questions that I believe um, that came in prior to the, to the webinar. We'll also do the one, some of the ones uh, that we can in the Q&A. So I'm going to um, ask um, Dr. Robinson, one of the questions here is, how um, how long after you have had a left upper lobectomy, so section of that left upper 
flow for an early stage lung cancer, can you kind of expect to have chest wall pain? What, what should people expect from their recovery time? So we talked about identifying cancers early, but I want to, uh, to also maybe talk about that recovery time. And, and you did a little bit of that in your, in your talk. And we also, I don't know if you guys can see the Q and a, we have somebody there who's, uh, running five miles um, in, a, in an hour and a half after having surgery at Moffitt. That's absolutely just phenomenal. Yes, amazing. Dr. Robinson, what are your thoughts on that? Chest wall pain after surgery, no matter how you do it, whether you do it robotically, uh, thoracoscopically, a small mini thoracotomy, um, can leave people with some chest wall pain, at least temporarily. Rarely does it last very long. And the reason the pain comes is is because of skin nerves. There's a skin nerve that runs underside of each rib and supplies a strip of skin that goes like stripes on a zebra out to the, uh, the front of the chest. And when you go in between the ribs, even just putting a chest tube in between the ribs, it'll bruise that nerve and it frequently causes initially not to work. Um, and you have some numbness and people won't really notice the numbness. Well, when the nerve comes back, it's angry and you can end up with various kinds of pain, uh, pins and needles, chest wall pain of various kinds in a localized distribution. Usually then that goes away over the course of about three to as much as six weeks. We use usually a lot of topical agents which help delay this. You can use everything from Voltaren cream to lidocaine cream. We found actually CBD cream works very, very well on them for unknown reasons. It's just, um, it's sort of topical, but it works very well. So that pain can persist and usually goes away without a problem. Once in a great while, I see probably one a uh, person every couple of years where it persists more than a couple, uh, a month or two, and it's causing a lot of difficulty. When that happens, it can be readily completely controlled. We have uh, our interventional anesthesiologists can do some localized nerve injections because they usually end up with what's called a neuroma. They can do some injections, uh, steroids, they can use radio frequency ablation, and almost always get the pain to completely go away. But usually that's not necessary, and I, it's rare that I have to send somebody because it usually goes on the way on its own. Usually you talk about, again, about three to six, maybe as much as eight weeks, and it should be gone. Great, that's really that's really helpful. I think it's all about um, you know coming to the right team, those that have done these surgeries on multiple times. We know that there's a lot of data that when you go to individuals who are more common with doing the surgeries that you're gonna have better outcomes. So, and then setting patients up on a path for recovery, and as well as also setting expectations of what that recovery should look like. So I appreciate that, um, uh, Dr. Robinson. That was a great, great summary. So Dr. Shabath, I have a, a question here from Mr. Cutler. Are AI and machine learning working together and assisting doctors uh, yet in the clinic, as well as working with the researchers in developing new therapies and procedures? Great yeah, question. Yeah, great question. Um, you know, we're even though we've been doing these sort of research for you know about a decade plus, and again, emphasize Moffitt is one of the leaders, one of the in initiators, it's still relatively in its infancy. So we're having to really convince grant funders to allow us to do the studies, to do these prospectively in patients. A lot of this has been done retrospectively, meaning you have patients and you, you're pulling their images and data and you, and you do, go through a really robust um, uh, what we call training of the model, identifying a model that works, and then you, you do a bunch of validation steps. So the next step is very similar to what Dr. Robinson is doing is a prospective observation trial. So we're waiting on funding to do that um, because this is really a new area. You know, there is a bit of skepticism, even though not just our groups, but across the country, across the world shows the value of this information and how important it is. With your, with your question about therapies and procedures, we've actually, we've, we've done remarkable work. You know, I've seen some questions about elk and other driver mutations. Mm -hmm. We've done a remarkable job using AI to predict a lot of these um, drivers, a lot of the, what we, the, the mutations that occur in, in lung cancers and PDL one, which is a protein qualifying for um, immunotherapy. And so we have all this wonderful data that we validated. It's, it is really the struggle to convince the National Cancer Institute and other, um, uh, other areas to fund the next step, which is mm -hmm. those prospective trials. Once we pull that off 
and we feel very confident this will work, then we can start delivering it. It would be very irresponsible to bring this to the clinic until you do that sort of next step, that prospective observational trial. Yeah, I think that that's a good, those are great points. And it kind of ties into one of the questions here, you know, um, just to kind of like step back a little bit, we're talking, we're kind of focused a little bit on, you know, early detection and lung cancer screening. And we recognize that there's some limitations to those CT scan reports that we get. And could we overlay these blood tests or could we overlay what Dr. Shabath had talked about, those AI technologies with the scans that we get and say, okay, this is what the radiologist sees. This is what the oncologist sees, but what does the machine see? And how can that kind of take all that information, the CT scan report, the blood test, and this radiology AI overlay and say, okay, now we can even better predict who is going to most likely have, uh, if that lesion is cancerous or not, or and or who's most likely to develop cancer in the future. And to that, there's this question here, um, uh, you know, and I can see where doc, both Dr. Robinson and Dr. Shabbat, but it's directed directly to Dr. Robinson for now. Because my wife and I have taken Galleria blood tests that detects markers for 50 types of cancers, including lung cancer. And, you know, you touched on these blood markers um, in your talk, Larry. Uh, the test came back negative. So would you still recommend a low-dose CT scan in, in, in these patients who are getting these tests? Um, you know, I know we work in a space where we think it's very important that these tests are validated in a certain way, but would love your thoughts on that. Dr. Robinson. There are commercial tests out, uh, such as the uh, uh, Galeria test, and there's, there's several others out there that are looking for cancers. The problem is that the sensitivity is not 100%. In fact, it's a lot lower than that. What I mean by sensitivity is how many people out of, say, 100 that have lung cancer are you going to be able to find with your test? And the sensitivity, well, how many will it pick up? And the sensitivity, uh, we'd like to have it close to 98 95% at least, so we're not going to miss any. The problem is most of these tests, the sensitivity is at best 60 or 70% sensitive. So there's going to be a significant number of individuals who may have a negative blood test yet still have lung cancer. And the problem about lung cancer, and most of these tests uh, don't find early stage cancers, they'll, they'll be very good with late stage cancers. The sensitivity gets much higher because there's so many more abnormalities that occur in the blood when you have a late stage cancer. Early stage cancers, the problem is there's not as much in the blood, uh, in fact, things you can find that will be show a positive, that will show you have a lung cancer. So if you're at high risk, uh, you know, it's good that your test came back negative, but I would definitely get yourself a low dose screening CT scan. Mm -hmm. That's really the only way that has a sensitivity is extremely high. It's very unlikely you're going to have a, a lung cancer and have a completely negative low dose screening CT scan. Yeah. And I think that that helps to um, kind of give also a state of where we are in reality today, that we are not yet ready to deploy these tests. They're there. We don't know yet how to fully interpret them with the low dose CT results and why the studies such as the one that Dr. Robinson was talking about and the work that Dr. Shabath is talking about is so critical to really put everything together and be able to more definitively uh, answer, answer these questions. Um, along that same vein, um, what do we think here about if you have an occupational exposure? Uh, that puts you at risk for developing lung cancer. Do you qualify for low-dose CT scan um, for that or whether or not you were, had a smoking history or not? And maybe we can talk even a little bit about what we're doing in the non-smoking uh, population also. Uh, I'll give that to Dr. Robinson and then, then Dr. Shabbat. Unfortunately, if you don't meet those criteria, you don't qualify for a low-dose screening chest CT scan without a smoking history. Uh, and that's that's that in other words, in other words, paid for. Now we know very well that if you're exposed to a lot of occupational exposures, that you have an increased risk of lung cancer. If you're a male, you have an increased risk of lung cancer, uh, despite smoking history. Exposures to a variety of heavy metals, uh, a lot of diesel exhaust. Uh, you kind of go through the whole list of a lot of exposures over time, increase your risk of lung cancer, but you don't yet. Uh, qualify to get a low-dose screening CT scan. The common thing that happens when they come in and we'll have a, uh, you have a family history of lung cancer, you have an elevated risk. I'll see a lady in the clinic 
the mother will come in and she's 65 years old, got a lung cancer, may or may not have been a smoker. And the two daughters are with her. And they say, well, should I get a low dose screening CT scan? Because are we at elevated risk? You are at elevated risk some. Uh, probably as you get older, it may be reasonable to get, but you wouldn't qualify necessarily for a low dose screening CT scan under the criteria we currently have. On the other hand, a low dose screening CT scan has a very tiny amount of uh, radiation and you can pay for it on your own if you want to. By the way, a low dose screening CT scan costs at Moffitt in most places about $150. This is about what it costs for a family of four to go out and have a meal at a reasonable place with no wine. So if it really, I tell people, if they're really concerned about it, um, and, and especially if they're over, say, the age of 50, uh, your doctor will get you a prescription. You can get a low-dose screening CT scan. But right now, those individuals who have elevated risk still don't qualify based under the criteria, but can still get a low-dose screening CT scan. We are doing a study, actually financed by patient donations, looking at never-smoking women who have lung cancer prospectively as an observational trial to try to look at other factors that may be involved. There's certain estrogen metabolites that appear to be carcinogenic. They're looking at that in breast cancer and we're looking at lung cancer because there's so many women, high dose, uh, uh, that women that have a higher risk of getting lung cancer. So there's a number of things we're looking at to try to sort this out. That's great. And and with that, you know, um, Dr. Shabath, I'd love to hear from you also on this topic. I think it is really something that we, we do need to spend some time on. We've made some progress, right, with low-dose CT scan. Um, where are we going in the future? What else do we need to do? Yeah. Well, you know, just I'll answer that in a second. Just to add on to what Dr. Robinson said, the reason why the criteria we have for lung cancer screening really came down to the clinical trials. First, the National Lung Screen screening trial in the United States, and then there were um, three more in Europe, and they based the inclusion criteria on age and smoking history. So that's why these other factors, which we know are causal, occupational exposures, and even maybe even where we live when it comes down to radon, um, those aren't included. I, I, I was the, I'm a member of an NC, the NCCN guidelines for lung cancer screening in the United States. These are, these are the guidelines that all of us follow. Originally, we wrote in these as sort of secondary criteria, not based on clinical trial data. It was basically based on the literature that we saw. It ended up causing a lot more confusion and those end up getting backed out. Um, and we simplified the criteria to what Dr. Robbins. Um, the future, you know, there's probably many. I think, you know, as Dr. Robinson alluded to, I think a potential would be a sort of rule in, rule out blood test would be nice as a starting point. Um, there's, for some reason, there's a lot of barriers for high risk individuals to get screened. Perhaps if there are some pinprick tests that can be done where you can sort of get a flavor and, and then you can use as a rule in and rule out test, much like one of the um, questions in there that they had one of the, 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 the biomarker tests. Um, another area, again, you know, I, I align with the, the interest of, of Dr. Robinson is never smokers. I, this, this is if never smokers who develop lung cancer were a separate category, it'd be the seventh leading cause of cancer related death in the United States. And and I've, I've been an epidemiologist for decades. I've published many papers on risk factors for lung cancer. And guess what? Except for smoking, the same risk factors related to, to smoking smokers who get lung cancer, in other words, all those occupational exposures, things like radon, those are also associated with never smokers. And we don't have a good way to find out who is who's who are the never smokers at greatest risk. So going back to the story of AI, we are actually using genetics. We are mining um, millions of these tiny variations that all of us have. The reason why some of us are tall, some of us are short, some of us have different length ears, all these tiny variations that encode who we are. We're 99.5% similar. We have 0.5% difference in these little variations. And some of these are related to, to disease risk. We're using AI methods to analyze these millions of variations and tens of thousands of people of never smokers who some have lung cancer who don't, to maybe use this, it's, it, it's, and it's an unorthodox approach, but this may give us a way to identify those who are at the greatest risk, uh, those never smokers at greatest risk. So that, that is another area that um, I'm hoping that we can 
crack, that nut we can crack to improve um, early detection for this for, for these individuals. Because typically, as, as Dr. Robin talked about, never smokers often present with a very late stage disease, very lethal. So mm-hmm. early detection of never smokers would be a game changer. Absolutely. Absolutely. I wholeheartedly agree, agree with that. And it's something that we are doing and that we must really continue to pursue um, and appreciate everybody's support. And I can see this is clearly something that we, we all feel passionate about. You know, in that setting, um, Dr. Math, maybe you could kick us off with answering, uh, to answer this question. It's, uh, it's talking about what the center is doing uh, from a public health standpoint. So what is the approach or approaches the center has taken to educate the, per- the public at large uh, on a nationwide scale about this issue? And, and what are we doing personally? Regarding screening? Regarding or- screening. Yeah, well, I, I would give the credit to you, Larry, and, and your team, Haley and Haley Tolbert, who I think is online, are doing a remarkable job of outreach. That has been our major barrier of getting people into Moffitt to get screened. We know anytime any of us have gone on TV or radio or anytime we put anything in print, we automatically see an uptick. And so we know there's a value about getting that message out. So that's number one, is getting that message out. We just signed that national letter that went out, that mm-hmm. went to the U.S. House representatives, that hopefully that we can get our, our representatives up in D.C. on board with this to make this a national issue. Because if we do, we know the success with breast cancer. We saw we mm-hmm. with breast cancer screening mm-hmm. and we see the ad, we've seen the advertisements over our lifetime and the outreach of that. We're not doing that with 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 lung cancer screening because, as as Dr. Robinson alluded to, alluded to, there's a lot of there was a traditionally a lot of stigma that this was an invisible disease, but it comes down to one simple fact: if you have lungs, you can get lung cancer. And so we need to change that perception of what this disease is, and we need to get the message out to the community that that this is that this is a life saving modality. Right, and Dr. Robinson, uh, can you? Um expand on that and, well, and add to that? What do you want to add to that? Well, it's it's Great remarkable question. how how just going out and meeting with the public in, in various venues. For example, two weeks ago, the Buccaneers have a uh, training. Um, it's not mm-hmm. a training camp for them. It's a training camp for young people in the uh, in east part of uh, Tampa. And they had a men's health screening huddle, they called it. And we all <laughs> talked about the various kinds of cancers down there, including lung cancer and lung cancer screening risks and so on. And uh, there were an enormous number of people there. And afterwards, a number of people came up to me, very intelligent people, very knowledgeable about things. And they said they had no idea that they had any risk for lung cancer because they'd mm-hmm. stopped smoking 15 years ago. They smoked a, a lot, mm-hmm. but they thought once they were out five or 10 years, Everything was fine. And people just do not understand that out in the community. And so the biggest thing is the more we can educate them publicly, whether it's in meetings and webinars and seminars and you you name the print, how we can do that and also educate the healthcare providers, because that's a problem as well. A lot of them don't think about that as much because they have, again, they think the stigma of the the old man with the COPD, he's got chronic obstructive lung disease, and he's the one that's going to have it. It's not the, the 55-year-old woman who smoked for 20 years when she was uh, younger who's at risk. So education of our providers and the community, we're working at very hard, and we're going to we're continue to increase that educational outreach. Mm-hmm. I think that's fantastic. And if I can expand on, on what Dr. Shabath was uh, mentioning also, we created a National Advocacy Council. Uh, it's a focus on lung cancer screening because when you do go up to Washington, when you know you go to each of the state's capitals, they're very familiar. I have to say, from a legislative standpoint, about lung can- about breast cancer, about colon cancer, about cervical cancer screening, but it's not really picked up yet with lung cancer screening. So I think, in addition to educating patients, in addition to educating providers, we're working very hard to educate our legislatures legislatures and and help to change policy, right? Make this something that is universal and accepted for all, uh, helping to remove the stigma, but also having them help us with the insurance carriers to ensure that there's quality metrics put in place so that you don't, uh, this is something that doesn't get missed when you 
go to your primary care office. Um, you know, we're going to do everything we can. Uh, you heard ha the name Haley. Haley. Haley Tolbert is amazing. She's head of our lung cancer screening program. And she really um, has focused on getting education out also across the state of Florida, across all the lung cancer, lung centers that do screening and is working on creating a Florida round, almost like a Florida round table where they get together and share back best practices. Uh, how do we keep up with the data? How do we create bigger um, databases of data? The more, you know, a lot of times when you can pull data across multiple sites together, we're just going to learn more. Exactly what Dr. Shabath was telling, the more that you have in, the more that we can subcategorize um, a lot of this. I just can also take a, a moment and just touch on uh, some topics, uh, themes I hear uh, I see here in the chat, and it really kind of pertains to, you know, being on uh, having a driver mutation that you heard about um, from Dr. Shabbat versus a non-driver mutation and how therapies are chosen. And so really one of the things when you're diagnosed with, initially diagnosed with lung cancer, especially at advanced stages, it's really important that we do genomic testing, uh, get genomic testing on your, uh, for your tumor. This can be now done through blood collections very similar to those biomarker analyses that you've heard from Dr. Robinson and saw in those pictures, as well as on your actual tumor biopsy. And then depending on the result of that, for example, if you have ALK mutation, gene rearrangement or ALK mutation, then you should go on an ALK inhibitor. And you should follow very closely. Um, for most drugs, whether you're on an IV oral medication, doses can be adjusted, you know, work very closely with your providers on that. A lot of times how we make that decision um, to put the patient on an immunotherapy is usually we treat patients with immunotherapeutics when you do not have what we consider a driver mutation. You have no ALK, you have no EGFR, you have no HER2. There's a list of about top 10. And those immunotherapeutics, the purpose of those are really to help support your immune system to fight your cancer. They don't actually um, do anything particularly to the cancer cells themselves. It's more about leveraging and activating your immune system and having your immune system uh, uh, attack that cancer. So hopefully that helped to answer some of the questions. Um, you know, and I do encourage anybody with side effects of any of their medications to really sit down with their, with their providers to sort through that. So Dr. Robinson, one of the questions we have here is about the LEAD program. Uh, are these three clinics, are, are they open now? Um, what if you were exposed to secondhand smoke all of your life, 64 years old, do you qualify for that low-dose CT um, and if not, how do you um, pay out of pocket for the low CT scan? Well, first of all, uh, all, all these clinics are actually open. Uh, we mm -hmm. have a surveillance clinic that's been going on for a number of years. We have the screening clinic and the lung nodule clinic we're just formalizing. We've been seeing lung nodules. I saw 10 this week, new patients with lung nodules. So all of the thoracic surgeons are, uh, are seeing it, but we're going to try to emphasize it more so we can get more patients in with lung nodules and organize the program greater. So it's, they're all open, they're all going. We're just going to have it a more formal program and be able to track people better, uh, particularly with software, because the software will really help with this because it's a, it's a, a yeoman's uh, task to try to keep track of all the patients, all the follow-ups and so on if you don't do this with, with some specially designed software, which is made exactly for this. So uh, that's easily done. In terms of getting a low-dose screening CT scan, if you're not a, a uh, you're not eligible based on the criteria, that can be done and paid out of pocket. You'll just need to get, I, I believe, you'll need to get a, a prescription for that from your uh, your local provider, your your physician, and they can uh, do that, and you can pay it out of pocket. Um, I should emphasize a low dose screening CT scan uh, is awfully safe in terms of radiation because people worry about radiation and what's the radiation from lung cancer screening, that sort of thing. Uh, uh, radiation is uh, designated and measured by what's called millisieverts. Uh, when you're walking around on Earth for a, for a year, you receive radiation all the time from the sun, ray, cosmic rays, and so on. You get about three millisieverts per year. A low-dose screening CT scan gives you about half of that. Uh, just dental x-rays give you about uh, one hundredth of that amount. Uh, you don't start to get into uh, having to stop getting radiation. If you say, if you work for radiation therapy, for example, after you get the 50 millisieverts, they have the little badges that measure. And it's felt that probably per year, up to at least 100 millisieverts of radiation every year wouldn't increase your risk of cancer. So a low-dose screening CT scan is a minuscule amount of radiation, probably about the same amount as you get from flight of here to, uh, to, to Thailand. You get about the same amount. So uh, that's, that's possible to do. 
And I think you can get a, a low dose screening CT scan if you're concerned about it and you don't meet those criteria. I also, there was, there was something mentioned also, which we're in the process of doing to try to enhance this, is trying to have what they we have twofers. You know about that at Publix. Well, we're going to try to see if we can get started getting patients who are coming in for the breast CT scan screening and who are eligible to try to get their low dose screening CT scan the same day when they come in um, and try to catch those people who are at el elevated risk. If you've had breast cancer, when there's a number of epidemiological studies, if you have breast cancer, you have a significant increased risk of lung cancer. And if you have any smoking history, it's very high. I just reviewed a whole paper about this and it's very, uh, very impressive. So um, in fact, two women mm -hmm. I saw today with breast cancer or had lung cancer, both yeah. had breast cancer in the past. So it's a, all of those are elevated risk. Yeah, you know, that's, that's a good point. And, and we're getting some questions here, uh, I think that are alluding to, you know, if we have an abnormality, if we have a concern, how do we get in contact with the, you know, there's some people who are talking about having pulmonary nodules. How do they get in touch with that clinic, Dr. Robinson? What if you've had cancer already early stage and you've had it resected? How do you get in touch to get follow-up on the surveillance clinic? Um, you know, those sorts of things, I think, is where we're, we're seeing that people are, they're thinking, they're like, they're, they're getting it. And uh, what is the next steps for them to do? What would be their guidance to them? Well, you can, uh, you can contact Moffitt for a new patient evaluation. And you don't have, you can self-refer. You don't have to have your doctor has to refer you to Moffitt. And probably at least a third of the people who come to Moffitt are self-referred. And you just need to tell them when you come up that you need to go to the lung nodule clinic, which mm -hmm. I staff. And, and actually, if we have any overruns, our other thoracic surgeons will also see them also. But I see most all of the, lung, the new undiagnosed lung nodules. We have a surveillance clinic uh, run by a thoracic surgeon as well. So if you want to have lung surveillance after you've had uh, a previous cancer, uh, they have a surveillance clinic and you can call up and arrange for an appointment and see them and they can end up with uh, the appropriate surveillance after your scan. If you have lung cancer and got cured, like I say, you have an elevated risk and you need some screening CT scans the rest of your life because it's uh, uh, it's probably one to one and a half percent per year. And we see a number of people who are out four, five, six, eight, ten 10 years and they have a second cancer, get it found early, get cured again and go about their business and continue to take cruises, pay taxes, that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> very nice. Vacation is very important. And, um, you know, and, and I think, you know, one thing from Dr. La Robinson's comment there that really continuing to get your scans, even after treatment, um, and, and following the recommendations of your physician and your provider team is very, um, is very important. Even if you had a stage one, uh, early stage lung cancer, you're still at risk of having recurrence. And so, Sticking with that plan is is really important. I think um, we're we're about at the almost at the end, um, and I uh, I really wanted to thank everybody so very much for really a, a fantastic thoughtful questions. You know, we're we're as I said, we're coming to the end. We come to the end of our session here. If we were unable to get to your questions tonight, don't worry. We will be following up with you and to get answers to all of your questions. And I think that will do it for us. Thank you again for being with us tonight. We hope you found the webinar informative. I wanna give a special thanks to Dr. Robinson, as well as Dr. Shabath and the whole team for putting this together. Such a great present great presentations. I know I certainly learned uh, during this evening with you. And we appreciate you and your continued support as we work to revolutionize cancer care and provide the best possible outcomes for all of our patients.